This is Support of Sexy, episode 31, with UA Gateway School of Technology founder and principal, April McCoy Robinson. Welcome to the Support of Sexy podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I am thrilled that you are here because you know it just would not be the same without you. So today I am welcoming someone who is truly so special to me. She is one of my best friends, Miss April McCoy Robinson. And April is the founder and principal of UA Gateway School of Technology High School, which is an award-winning high school in New York City. I'm proud to say that I am the chair of the board at the school. And the work that April and her staff and every Everyone there at the school does is just incredible to witness, to be a part of, and to just see the impact that they have on the students. So I thought it was a great idea to have April on the show because she is a founder of a school and she has so much insight on the effect of education or lack of education on today's students. So some of the things you'll learn in this episode are three tips for successfully opening and running a school what stereotype threat is and how it affects students, also the dangers of adultifying young people, the importance of modeling, why educators need to be uncomfortable, I thought that was really powerful, why it's okay and even empowering to cry at work, something that I was told to never do, but quite a few of the women that I've spoken to have talked about the power in that, and April goes into that. She also speaks about why you must approach everything with radical sincerity. And one of the great things I have to say that April provides at the end of this episode are must-read books for all educators. In fact, they're books that I'm going to pick up myself. So So make sure to listen out for that at the end. Be sure to check the website, ElaineFluker.com, for the show notes that list all of the books and give you links to each one of them. So there's tons of great information in this episode, especially if you're someone who is already within the education system, considering it as a teacher, or if you're thinking about creating your own school. Without further ado, April McCoy Robinson. (laughs) You're so cute. So, April, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm happy to have you here. Thank you, Elaine, for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? (laughs) Hmm. You know, I know that you asked this question to all of your guests, and I I really started thinking about this a couple of weeks ago, and I realized that I'm not sure if it is entrepreneurship that I fell in love with or the idea of taking something that was really near and dear and close to my heart and bringing it to another level. And so, you know, I'm the founder of the Urban Assembly Gateway School for Technology. And in 2010, when I was an assistant principal, I was approached by Jennifer Ostro, who was the the development coordinator for new schools. And she said, hey, April, um, the the UA is looking to open up a school. And um, would you like to open a school? And so I'm, I'm an AP. I was just recently married and I didn't really have any intention of opening my own school. And I said to her, you know what, Jennifer, I'm, I'm going to get back to you. <laughs> and I, I actually didn't rise to the occasion right away. And it took a lot of soul searching and it just took some time for me to think about, well, what kind of school would I want my own children to go to if I had them? And what are the, some, some of the things that I've learned as an educator over the years that I could either um, continue the best practices and things that I'm going to end as a principal myself? And so after a couple of days of thinking about it, I got back to her and I said, yes, I would absolutely love to open my own school. And so it wasn't necessarily that I fell in love with entrepreneurship, but I actually fell in love with the idea of taking something that I was passionate about and um bringing it to the next level and using this opportunity. Because had they not approached me, I don't know if I ever would have done this. Mm. So like I saw the opportunity, I saw the window and I, and I jumped. Nice. I love that. Sometimes it just comes to you and you never know where, you know, when it's going to show up or how it's going to show up or that it was even something that you wanted to do. I didn't even know I wanted to do it, to be honest. And and then I thought to myself, well, who opens a school? <laughs> I had no idea what the process was. I had no idea that people actually did this for me. Like schools like this always existed since the beginning of time. You just go there. Right. And so the idea that I could develop my own was just something that came to me. I didn't I didn't understand the process. So I had to learn that process um, in designing my school. 
So let's talk about April as a little girl and how you got here. So you were born in Jamaica. I was. And Boyaka. You, <laughs> you came. Oh, no. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. And you, came, you came to the U.S. when you were seven, right? Yes. Yes. So what was April like as a little girl? Oh, gosh. So April is a little girl. So many things. So many, so many things. So I grew up in Jamaica for the first seven years of my life. And my mother had to leave Jamaica when I was one. And so from the time that I was one to seven, I didn't really get to see my mom often. She'd come back every once in a while. But I do remember as a kid in Jamaica, just having a longing for something else. And the United States was always that something else. And so when my mom sent for me, they call it sending for someone, like you send for a package. <laughs> my mom sent for me um, and I came up here, I... I I was just so excited to be in the United States to hear all these things. And when you're an, when you're an immigrant child somewhere else, you can't imagine the streets to be lined with gold. Um, it was the Bronx in the 1980s. And it, wasn't say, lined, it wasn't lined. It wasn't lined with gold. It was lined with something <laughs> but it, else. <laughs> right. But it, but, it, but it was good enough. It was good enough. And um, so we lived in our apartment in the Bronx. And I remember my mom worked a lot. My mom worked, is, is one of the most hardworking go-getting people I've ever met in my entire life, if not the most go-getting person um, in my entire life. And so I just witnessed her working a lot to, you know, put food on the table. I remember her having two or three jobs. I remember her, um, she worked at a insurance company and she had, she actually worked in that company for about 30 to 40 years. And the idea of stability was something that really stuck with me. The idea of being secure really stuck with me. And so going back to the original question about designing my own school and going out there and taking a risk, I had already in my mind like had a, had a plan for myself. And the risk of opening a school that may or may not be a failure was something that I wasn't trained um, or, or brought up to, to, to do. Like you go with the short things. Mm. And so um, I was into security as a kid. Um, I remember um, like many of us were in the 1980s, that, that term last key child. I was a last key child in the 1980s and I would go to school. Um, and I would I would come back home but on my own, and I remember being home alone a lot. And what I the one thing I did do was read. I read. Mm. I was an incredible reader, and I, I made my own reading list. And I would check off the books I wanted to read. They had these book fairs in the 1980s. I don't know if you remember this, but these book fairs where they would come and you'd get to order all these books. And there was never a happier time in my life than when I got to order books. And when the books would come, I would stay up all night with a little flashlight in my bed, just reading and reading until Aww. my eyes burnt. And um, and it's funny that I was a I was a reader, but I wasn't always a homework doer. So I, I don't want to paint the picture of like this really studious kid. <laughs> Not at all. You know, I was the kid that handed homework in late. I had the excuse, you know, my, the dog ate my homework, whatever it was. I I left it on the on the bus, whatever it was. I had an excuse for it. But the one thing I consistently did was that I was a reader, and I saw my mom reading a lot as well. I think that that inspired me. So as the kid, I was a reader. I definitely was in my head a lot, and I I also remember being a sneaky kid and I remember always feeling like the things that I wanted to do weren't always like necessarily accepted mm. and so I was a sneaky kid and like you know when I wasn't supposed to be watching tv I'd be watching tv when I wasn't supposed to be eating something I'd be eating something um and so like so this this idea of me being these two different people like the this the, the studious reading person and the sneaky kid like with the duality of who I was and um and that, that was pretty much it. Um, when I went to I went to elementary school in the Bronx, and in the '80s, you know, the, the New York City public school system wasn't what what it is, um, but it wasn't what wasn't what it, what it is like now. Um, for example, there's a lot of accountability as a principal, and right now as a principal, there, there are very few things that that I could do or that teachers t could do that would we would get away with. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I remember is that teachers like read the newspaper in front of the classroom and would say like, go to page 58. And, you know, you had to like read from page 58 from two o'clock to three o'clock or so. And like something like that is unheard of. And I remember that I didn't really understand what, what great teaching looked like. I didn't understand what my rights were as a kid. But I do remember having some teachers that absolutely believed in me. I had Miss Miller in the second grade. I had Miss Miller again in the fourth grade, again in the sixth grade. I had Mr. Goodrich in the fifth grade. And these teachers really absolutely believed in me and they helped me to develop as, as a student overall. And one final thing about me as a kid is that I was I was because I read often, um, I was placed in the in the the, the gifted class mm -hmm. and it was a heavily tracked system in the 1980s. And so your class was like one, one, uh, two, one, three, one. And if you were in the one class, that was great. 
Um, if you were in the two class, eh, you kind of you didn't make the mark. <laughs> if you were in the three class, mm, if, by the time they got to like cl- the fifth class or so, like two five, like those are the classes that kids are throwing chairs. Like it just just lock the door. Teachers are rotating in and out. And so I remember feeling like I had to hold on to my position in the one class a lot. So which is why the reading came into play um, for me as well. So I was in elementary school in the Bronx. I went to PS 103 um, on Carpenter Avenue. And in for middle school, I went to Olinville Junior High School, which back then was, was possibly the worst junior high school in all of New York City. Mm. But again, I had teachers that, that really, really believed in me. And no matter how busy my mom was, I remember having teachers like Miss Warner, and she would say to us, well, you're, you're black and you are, you're, you're a girl, so you have to work twice as hard as everyone else. And I didn't quite... Sh- I didn't quite know what she meant by it. Because first of all, we were all black. And, and again, the Bronx in the 80s, you were, you were Jamaican or Puerto Rican, right? Mm-hmm. And so I didn't know who the other they she was talking about all the time. And she was black. But she was black. And so she, teachers like Miss Warner, I had, that really pushed us. And regardless of what we looked like, regardless of where we came from, regardless of like how shabby our clothes was, regardless of, um, you know, whether or not we had lunch for the day, Miss Warner always just like presented herself so beautifully to us and presented to herself like a parent to us. And I connected so much to these, to these pseudo parents, these pseudo parent teachers that stepped in and knew that they were doing a dual role. Cause it wasn't like my mom was not um, around at all. My mom was working as mm-hmm. most of the parents were um, in my neighborhood working all the time. So they didn't really have a chance to, to spend that, that quality time with us. And so in the eighth grade, I had Miss Corpinato. And Ms. Corpinato is actually still an educator. And Ms. Corpinato is the one that led us to like this advanced level math. And so when I, by the time I graduated um, from junior high school, I, I, I had a foundation of love and caring and feeling like I really connected to um, the adults that were in my school. And anyone that this, this saw something special in me, it made me perform the absolute best. Um, by the luck of the draw, I took I took the um, the gifted and talented test to get into um, a specialized high school. And I don't know what, maybe the stars were aligned. I have no <laughs> idea how I got in, but I, got, I ended up getting into Bronx Science, the number two school in New York City. Uh-huh. The number one school was Stuyvesant. Um, the number two was Science and the number three, three was Brooklyn Tech. And so then again, like the whole ranking system came into play with me and I, I I was so proud to be accepted. Look at me, this girl from the Bronx um, that had no formal training, an immigrant, barely spoke correct English, still still struggle. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, Barely spoke correct English that was able to get into this school. I felt really, really proud of myself. My mom was really proud as well. And I got into Bronx Science and when I went there, again, being exposed to like kids that I had no idea the city was so multicultural, first of all. I had never you spent seen so most many... of your time in the Bronx. Exactly. <laughs> and so I had never seen like so many Asian kids. I'd never seen so many white kids in one place. And some of them had cars. <laughs> and some of them, you know, just like just had totally different, amazing clothes. Just all these things just really was very shocking. It was a, it was a huge culture change and culture shift for me. And when I went to Bronx Science, something happened to me that I actually didn't know happens to lots of black and brown kids when they're exposed to white students and to Asian students as well. And there's, 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 so, there's like there's been countless research done around what happens to black and brown kids when they're exposed to white students and to Asian students. And there's a thing called stereotype threat. And Claude Steele writes, writes a lot about that in his book, Whistling on Vivaldi. What's it it's called? A, it's Whistling. A, Whistling Vivaldi. It's a beautiful book. And the things that he breaks down there is so amazing about what happens um, intellectually and how black and brown kids actually perform. When you when you tell them that they are up against white and Asian students, they underperform by by large amounts. And so I got to Bronx Science and within like a week, I was ready to drop out. I was why, cutting. Now, why does he say that that is? Or why was it that the case for you as well? Is it just you see how this no- you... you ex- perceive them as exceptional and then you think of yourself as absolutely absolutely and I I I get so angry at institutions like Bronx Science when I think about the fact that that research was out then and they so they know that black and brown kids go through the struggle but yet nothing is done to like help them reach their fullest potential Mm. a girl a girl from the Bronx right that shows up um, with no training, no formal test prep or anything that gets into that school is an exceptional girl. All the kids that get in there are exceptional. All kids are exceptional and have, have a beautiful light. But the fact that no one in the school like recognized and saw us 
Uh, we basically, I basically cut every single day in Bronx Science. We would, we would go down to the, um, to the, to the cafeteria all day long and play a game called Spades. We play Spades. We were running Boston's on each other left and right. And like when you looked around at the school, all the black and brown kids were hanging out together. All the black and brown kids were not doing well. All the black and brown kids mm. were sitting in the back of the classroom. And no and one I, really took notice of that, a teacher or anything. Like in your past experience where teachers seem to really step up and say, look, this is what you have to do. This is your reality. It sounds like in that school, it was a little different. And and not just that, not this is your reality, but your your insecurity is right. You don't belong. Right. Because when you are sitting there and I remember be, sitting in certain classes and I, I excelled in math up until I went to that until I went to that school. And I remember being handed like different worksheets than what the other kids got. I remember being allowed to sit in the back of the classroom and just like cut up. And it wasn't because I it wasn't because I wasn't capable because I, I believed I wasn't capable. And I do think it's, it's somewhat irresponsible for people who are teaching all, all students to not know the impact of stereotype threat, to not know the impact of just being exposed to a different way that, that the students are not used to. Like if you're going to get an education, you should know the history and you should know what the impact of the work you're doing is to the kids. And so I, I think I, I, I get very frustrated in the designing of my school. I made sure that there would be no student that would come into my school and be ignored or that we would not try to tap into every, every, each and every child's brilliance and each and every child's just inner light. And so that was a really huge f- factor for me in designing um, UA Gateway, which is my school. And do you so, think yes. That, sorry to interrupt. Do you think that um, people think that normally be, when you're in this environment where you have people that you perceive as quote unquote better than you, et cetera, that the kids, that the thinking is, oh, well, these kids will step up or it just was sort of the, you and the other no. kids were just left to the side. Like, oh, we just have them in here because we have to have a certain number of black and brown kids. I think that people either start to feel sorry for us, which is like low expectations, yeah. or people, you know, there's there there are people that believe that black and brown kids are intellectually less less capable, and that's not something that that's a racist thing. It is ingrained. It is ingrained in, in our brains that black and brown kids are less capable than everyone else. And so I think that when you give into that and where you're not fighting that on a daily basis and doing something to correct that, it perpetuates the situation. They did a. They did, in the inverse. There was a study about um, when you tell white males that they're playing basketball against um, African American males. It doesn't matter how good they were before. They actually they, they actually start doing worse when they when the comparison is made or when they're told that they're they're, they're being um, compared to like like black black guys that, that can quote unquote play basketball. And it's because and of so, this perception in your mind that they're automatically going to be better than you. Exactly. Same thing with women in math. Like, if we wonder why women don't get into math and sciences, mm-hmm. when you tell women that, you know, their math, that this particular test is a math test and we know that men do better on math tests, automatically women will not do better, do the same or score in the same mm-hmm. proficiency, level, proficiency levels as, as males. And so I think that when you educate, when you, when you educate young people, you kind of have to know these things in the background as you're designing your school, as you're designing your policy and as you're designing the, the culture and the atmosphere where kids are either going to thrive or not do well. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's funny that when I was designing UA Gateway, I didn't even know that all this stuff was, was affecting me. I didn't even know that, that, like, I didn't know about stereotype threat until I read about stereotype threat. Mm -hmm. And in reading Claude Steele's book, I'm like, what? Oh my gosh, this was me. Yes, yes, yes. And I remember fast forward a few, fast forward to a little, a little time later when it was time for me to go to college, I actually ended up you know, copying the 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 college application of a of a boy that I liked at the time, <laughs> and he put down. I'm not even kidding. I think you know who that boy I is. I know who that boy is. <laughs> Lord, married with children as am I, and happy. <laughs> However, if this man, if this guy knew how how much I was in love with his life, so there was a student, there was a, a, a young a young black boy that went to um, Bronx Science with me. And after failing, <laughs> I, I, I failed almost like every every single year, every single class. But the one thing that saved me was that I would take these exams called the Regents exams. Mm-hmm. And I was at home teaching myself like basically trigonometry and chemistry and all those subjects. And I would show up on test days and I would I would do well on the test days. And that's what kind of got me out of the school. Wow. And they, they, they tried to put me out several times. and My mom was not having it. Her, her, her little Jamaican daughter was going to Bronx Science. And that was that. Right. And I remember when it came time to apply to college, I had no idea like what college to apply to. I had no idea um, like what the process was. My mom surely didn't know and was expecting for the school to help me. 
And I remember sitting around at a, at a, at a lunch table and the boy next to me who I liked um, was filling out an application and he put down Hampton university. And so he's like, Oh, what school are you applying to? And I'm like, Oh, Hampton. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you're you're applying to Hampton too? Oh my gosh! Um, <laughs> what a coincidence! Oh my gosh! And I remember being just—I I was in love with him, but I was also just in love with his life. His family seemed to have what the was, Huxable life. I was going to say, what was it about his life that made you be like, "This is this is"? It was it too also seeing this possibility for a black family was was different. Absolutely, too? absolutely. Like he had two parents. Like they owned a house. Um, <laughs> these are standard things across the board. But for again, for for immigrant Jamaican little girl me like it just those things were a far reach for me mm-hmm. and so I applied to the school I don't think I applied to any other school actually mm-hmm. and again I think there's certain times in my life that I have to recognize that there is there is some greater power or grace out there for me that is saving my little butt mm-hmm. because I remember I got the letter back from Hampton University and lo and behold I was accepted and you know those two pinnacle po- points for me were, were life-saving points for me. When I ended up going to Bronx Science, that was a life-saving point for me to expose me to like what other, to what other people live like and to expose me to like just, just better for myself. And um, if not, I would have gone to my default um, high school. Mm-hmm. And, you know, on any, on any given day, like the line for me was so thin, you know, to be pr- a pregnant, not a pregnant teenager with like many kids or, um, to have to have a, a life for myself that was one that was in respect to the talents that I had, in respect of the of the, of the work that I could do, and not to say that someone who has who has a child young is doomed for life. Like I've known many young people who who've, who've done wonderful for themselves, mm-hmm. but I know that for me personally, this was not the right thing for me. But I, but again, like that window of being accepted to Bronx Science and the window of being accepted into to Hampton. I had never even been to the school. I think I had to like look up where it was when I got the acceptance. <laughs> and and lo and behold, it turns out that Hampton was a historically black college or university. And thank that goodness for the boy that you thank, had the crush on. Thank goodness for the boy that I had a crush on. And I ended up going to Hampton and you talk about like a, just a turnaround in academics and a turnaround and, and, and believing in myself and the power of like intellect and the power of, 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 of being able to really design and determine what my next steps were and not, not be such a victim or wait for something to happen. or So the, the power of getting into Hampton was really big for me. And being there with just all black and brown people that were I was all say, doing what was, well. Was that a different kind of um, culture shock for you? So I had this one boy that I that I was in love with and he was a Cosby, like, like 3,000 Cosby <laughs> in one right, place? Right. I was like, like what is happening? <laughs> I was in seventh heaven, like to walk around the campus and like my hair was just like your hair and my skin was just like your skin. And, and what I, at that point, my intellect is just like your intellect. And it, it wasn't that I, again, it wasn't that I, that I, that I thought that, that white students were so much better, but like, that's the stereotype threat that black and brown students go through on a regular basis. And with the removal of that stereotype threat, I absolutely thrived in that, in that, in that environment. And I also think back to my elementary schools for the most part were black and brown. And I think that's also like, I just thrived. And I, for the first time I cared about my GPA. And when I saw that I can get a 3.3 that first semester, every, every semester after that was my goal to get a 4.0. And I, you know, I wasn't always a stellar student, but I was always striving to be a stellar student. And I, I majored in history at, um, at, 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 at Hampton. The boy that I had the crush on also happened to major in history. Happened to <laughs> Coincidence again. If you only knew how deep the coincidences go, but, but just because I know this might get out, I'm just going to stop right there. It will get out. So yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And so after that, I, I went on to grad school. I went to NYU for grad school. And there was a moment in, in grad school where that was, the, I remember this defining moment in grad school where that for me was when the stereotype threat broke. And when I realized that I was just as capable, just as worthy, and just as smart as anyone else. And I remember I was sitting in grad school and there was a book that we had to read. And again, when I was confronted with being in the, in the, in a predominantly white class, I, there I was, in the back of the class again. I don't know. I don't know. I put myself in the back of the class and I was so intimidated to raise my hand. And there was a, a, I remember there was a young white guy in the front and this guy doesn't know how he changed my life, but he did. He was just talking about this book and I, I didn't agree with what he was saying. 
And he was just like just going off about his thesis on this book and what he thought and 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 defending it. And I, it dawned on me that he was just as clueless or intelligent as I was. Like there was no special magic in him. Right. It was his and opinion about this. That book. was his opinion, and it was and it just happened to be different. And I think I was 22 years old before I realized that I was just as capable. It took, it took me 22 years to figure out that I was just as capable. Some of I was us just never as do. worthy. I was just as smart. I was just as intelligent. Every graduation speech that I give to my students, I mention the fact that, and I always tell them, you are as smart as anyone else in the room. And there are different smarts and, and like respect those smarts. You know, you could be you could be emotionally smart. You can be book smart. You could be street smart. Whatever your smarts are, like build on them and like recognize the smarts where you're not so smart. Just work on it. But that moment for me when I was 22, when I realized that he was just BS in the way that I would and, <laughs> and he didn't know as much as he didn't know anything more than I did was really revolutionary for me. And then after that, I, I, I became a teacher and I have always sought to make sure that my kids know that their potential is infinite and that it, it, it's oftentimes our mindsets and it's oftentimes times what we think we cannot do that limits us from doing things. And when you are willing to like expose and say, hey, I don't know this, help me, help me, help me. Mm -hmm. Like my goal is to always empower my students. I should have said at Bronx, at Bronx Science, hey, why is, my sheet, why is my worksheet different than this sheet? But I wasn't empowered to do that. I should have said, you know, I haven't been to English in, 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 in four days, help me get to English. I really miss my English class, I've been cutting. But I wasn't able to like just empower myself and I wasn't able, I didn't have that voice. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt like, you know, it made me feel sneaky and I felt like things were just, were just always something that I either I couldn't handle or something that I, that I, so it, for me, like that moment when I was 22 really helped a lot and has been a guiding force for me as, as an educator overall. At what point did you come to the realization that you wanted to teach? Cause it's so interesting. I mean, you, like you said, you did great through elementary school and then into high school, things got off track because of just the, the lack of interest from the teachers. But at what point did you say, I want to be a teacher? Was it at Hampton? Was it when you got out and you were thinking of what you wanted to do? Right. So it just so happened the guy I had a crush on, he also was... <laughs> I'm not lying. I'm telling you. <laughs> I never knew what I wanted to do with Lane Fluker. I never knew. But again, my thing has been to like see someone that's doing so well. Can I? And just, yes, like I see you someone though? that's doing well and just like, I can you, do that. Okay. That means that you've known from an early age, because it's so funny. There are books and theories and everything on this now about modeling the behavior of people <laughs> who are in a place that you want to. So you were just modeling. You were modeling was, the behavior of this person yes. from where they wanted to go to college, what they wanted to do with their career. Clearly you were ahead of your time. So, so again, this person I had a crush on, <laughs> he happened to major in history. Then he happened that the senior year said he was going to go into teaching. So I'm like, oh my God, I can teach too. <laughs> because I, again, I didn't feel like I had it, like I had it in myself to decide on my own. I just didn't know what to do. And I didn't have many models for myself as well. So I, so I did what he did. And so I started teaching and I told myself that I was going to teach for three years. And then I was going to go into historical research for film, got in the classroom and, and had a really good time. Like really loved the kids. It was hard work. And, and it's, Teaching is a performance art, and I'm not always a performer. And so, like, developing the performance art of teaching was, was lovely. Getting to know those kids was lovely. And when my three years came up and I told myself I was leaving, I, I simply, I just could not do it. Mm. And I ended up just staying in the classroom. And I think that's when I began getting getting into my own flow and, 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 and seeing my own path and deciding my own path as well. I love that. And you're, it's funny because you're, an, I think you're a natural performer, but I think being in front of an uh, audience classroom but an audience probably brought it out of you even more thank you do you think thank that's you. why you fell in a part of the reason you may have fallen in love with it too yes and I also think the reading that it took because I, I love to read the reading that it took the idea that I was constantly expanding my brain and in increasing my intelligence and becoming smarter and smarter was also a really an attractive thing for me um, so that was really attractive for me as well. And then I, can I tell one quick story about becoming an AP? Of course. So I was, I was a teacher for a long time. And then one of the fellow teachers there, he not came the in and he had a, no, not him. <laughs> he, had a, he had a bunch of books in his hands. I go, what's going on? He goes, hey, I'm, I'm enrolled in school. I go, what are you in school for? And I'm going to be an, I'm, I'm going to be an administrator. I'm going to be assistant principal. And I was like, like, in my head, you're, you're, you're going to do it. 
well, hell, I can do it too. <laughs> so once again, I use that as a as a stepping stone because I saw someone else do it. I said to myself, he is no smarter than me. He is no better than me. I can do it too. And that's what began my path to administration. And I never saw myself as becoming a long-term administrator, but I actually officially have been an administrator longer than I've been a teacher, which is something that for me, when that, that switch happened, I, I realized like, wow, I, I feel like I did change my career. I feel like I did do something different. And which is also not typical with me because I, I like the security. I've been trained to be secure. And um, however, when just seeing other people be successful and seeing what others can do and, and, and convincing myself that they are, again, they are no better and no, wor- no more worthy than me has, has been a driving force for me. And I think that's important too in seeing, being open to it also because the people could be doing, like you said, you saw this, this guy who said, I'm going for this uh, to be an administrator. And you can say, oh, that's nice. And just left it at that, which there's nothing wrong with that, but it it stops you from even considering the possibility for yourself. So you were open right. to the possibilities. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I think, thank you. Absolutely. I was. And yeah, I was <laughs> <laughs> open to the possibilities and doing whatever your crush did. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned earlier about urban assembly approached you in 2010, right? To yes. start the new school. So yes. what, what was that moment like when they, they did come to you? I know you said you had to give it some thought over a few days, but were you wondering at any point, how did they find me? Why did they choose me? What is Urban Assembly about? Now, I, I knew the organization through um, Jennifer Astro, who is a, a colleague of mine. Mm-hmm. And I knew that they were um, into opening schools. And Richard Kahn, who's the founder, is, is passionate about about bringing black, more black and brown kids in the middle class. And so I knew the mission of the organization was something that was going cr- very much close to my heart. And so when they approached me, I was definitely honored and I wasn't sure that I could, I could live up to the challenge. And that, that was my first, I think the first thing that, that made me very hesitant. I wasn't sure if I could do it. And I started thinking, I did my, I did a little research and I found out that like regular folks like me, assistant principals are writing proposals for schools. Um, Folks that just had a really good idea for a theme for a school. And I, I felt very connected to technology. I felt connected to the theme of technology and I wanted to open a school that if my kids went there, they would be able to not only get a great uh, college experience and college preparatory education, but also something that would really prepare them to be producers of technology. And so that I know that black and brown kids are, are not often represented in technology. So that was where I wanted to make a mark and where I wanted to be able to say, like, hey, um, if nothing, we put a lot of we put more students, more black and brown kids into the role of technology as producers. Nice. And that's why you went the direction of designing a technology school. in. Absolutely. Yes. And even though I, I like technology, I didn't know much about it. Again, I had to hit the books and I had to research like what exactly is software engineering? Mm-hmm. Uh, what exactly is digital design animation? What does information technology entail? And so I did a lot of reading and I did a lot of research on um, what was out there and tried to try to develop courses for my kids that would be necessary once they graduated. And that's interesting, too, like just what you mentioned, you didn't go for what you already knew. You went for, as I said, looking at your clients or customers or in this case, the students and what their needs really were or what you thought Mm -hmm. their needs would really be. Absolutely. And and I I, I love I love singing and dancing. Like I love to sing and dance. But I I, 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 I performing arts school. (laughs) I don't think I didn't think the world needed one more performing arts school. Right. No, no no disrespect to any performing arts school. Exactly. No disrespect. Please don't email us. So (laughs) now the statistics on your school, is it 52 percent Hispanic, 29 percent black, 11 percent Asian and 6 percent white? Yes. So you're really taking care of black and brown. You're taking care of all your kids. Let's say that. I am. And, I, is, and I love all of my you kids. You love all of your kids. I've seen you with them. Um, but it is interesting that it comes sort of full circle that now you are leading a large segment of black and brown kids into their futures. Right. And I get, it, it ties into the idea that every kid has something special. Every kid has a light in them. And I don't, I don't feel like my light was seen when I was in high school. And when I think about, about the threat of how close it was for me to be a statistics and how, cl- how close it was for me to not graduate, every kid has a light. And it's, it's, it's my job and it's our job to bring that light forward, to bring out their best talents, to bring out their excellence. And so, like, I don't, I don't say all of my kids. I say each of my kids because within each of us is just something very special. And I think that when you're young, people tend to forget. And, like, there's a lot of anger of, of, 
you know, with teenagers, especially to kids of color, there's a lot of adultifying of kids of color. Mm. And so it, it's it's my mission to kind of like slow the process down. What we have in front of us here is a beautiful young child, regardless of what they bring to the table on any given day. Like it's just a beautiful human being that you were once a stage as well. Um, what can we do to bring out their lights and talents and what can we do to help them have their, their best potential? I love that. Now, what has been the most rewarding about running your own school? Something that is is interesting, I will say this, the learning that I get from my colleagues and the learning that I get from the people around me. And one of the things that I actually don't like to do is, is, is speak publicly. And what I don't like to do as well is like sharing my ideas to get critical feedback. <laughs> and that has been the best experience for me. I, I like to be in my head. I like to have ideas. I like to live out those ideas. And I, I like to just go ahead with it. However, the best experience has been for me has been working with, for example, my assistant principals. If I have a plan and I and I put it out, they have no problem saying, um, that's not going to work or <laughs> let's try it this way or no, I don't like this. And this experience of just like talking about education, talking about theory, talking about research, um, talking about best practices and pushing back. Mm-hmm. That has been that has been the greatest experience for me uh, so far as working with adults. So far as working with kids, the rewards there are 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 endless, are endless. To really connect with a young person and in any way guide them in the right step, in any way um, help them make a really good decision for themselves, in any way help them feel good about themselves. What a delicate time you are at, at fourteen to, to eighteen. There is no more delicate time. I think the only time that you're more delicate is when like you're you're. A newborn right <laughs> like when you are just so raw so open when you have so many options and you you can make good choices or you can make not so good choices and so for me anytime that I feel or or they feel that I have helped them towards the right the right direction it's it feels amazing to me and I and I don't think that we're out there like not every kid is, not every black and brown kid is the same and not every black and brown kid is destined to like sell weed and like so like this idea of like of like these huge changing lives um, theory. Yes, yeah, sure that happens sometimes, but it's the little thing. It's helping um, a kid like Nestor decide instead of going to plumbing school, he's going to try out um, college for a year to see how that goes. It's helping um, DeAndre with his speech he's writing to give at Goldman Sachs at um at one of their benefit dinners. It's these little things where you get to contribute in a positive way to their lives on a regular basis that feels so rewarding. It's amazing. That's amazing. And you are changing lives. I've seen Thank it. Thank you. I've seen it. I've been witness to it. And the kids just love you and your staff there. And that's one of the things. I mean, it's an inspiration because of, as you said, all this what is it? Adultifying of children. Yes. Right. Yes. And also yes. this idea that it, they people just say that all schools are failing our children and some schools are trying, you know, right. more than trying. And the challenge, the challenge is real. The struggle is real. And the challenge is real. Well, what are some but, of the challenges? That was going to be one of my next questions. Great question. Um, the challenges include um, addressing literacy Addressing the fact that that so many of our kids, when they come in in ninth grade, may have a fourth grade reading level. How do you get that kid that kid to college level reading by the time that they graduate? Um, the challenges include the finances of the school, where you know what I really need, or you know, fifty teachers, but I can afford thirty five. Um, the challenges include. Uh, you know, trying to get a talented first year teacher to stay in it um, when the work is so hard, trying to convince someone that, yes, you, you do have to lesson plan four to five hours a night. But I'm telling you, by year four, you'd be planning one hour a night, you know, that, that kind of thing. Having someone really just see it through for, for the long run. That part is challenging. The challenges of doing just the, the day to day relationship building, and resource, you know, of, of staff. Um, one thing that I've learned as a principal is that, uh, you know, relationships are every Thing. And I, I'm, I'm in a relationship with every single person there. Like some are good and some are bad. But we're, if I just say hello to you in the morning, that's a bad relationship. So mm-hmm. I have to do something about it. If we just say hey, and just accepting that responsibility that that everyone in some way wants to connect with the leadership of the building to feel like they're doing a good job. And that's hard to manage when you have so many things on your table. And one of the big challenges, one of the biggest challenges for me is, because I think, I think I'm a very nice person, but one thing that I have had to do as a principal is have really difficult conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, 
one thing I've learned is that as the principal of the school, like really my main job and my most important job is to have difficult conversations. I have a note in my on my computer that I read every day and it says it is your only job to have the difficult conversations. And this is about like around teaching and learning. It's about maybe your lesson plan was not that awesome, but you're a great human being. Maybe it's, I know you plan for six hours, like we talked about, but somehow still, you know, it's not connecting to the students. Um, maybe the conversation is about um, with a parent about a child not gra- graduating. Maybe the conversation is about, you know, with a guidance counselor about a child that has, you know, is suicidal or um, may have to get checked into the hospital. And so these, difficult conversations like that make like they literally make my stomach hurt every day Mm. and when I when I'm at work and you know I go a couple of days without my stomach is without my stomach hurting I know I'm not doing my job so I actually have to every single day like do a check are you getting too comfortable are we all getting too comfortable because I do think that when I go back to the when I think back to my childhood in the 80s like everyone in that building was comfortable why did no one walk by like Mr. So-and-so's class and say, should you be reading the newspaper while those kids are like reading, you know, or should we really have a class where some kids are locked up in here and, you know, like it's only substitute teachers come. I, I th- you know, someone at Bronx Science saying, should all the black kids be sitting in the back of your classroom? Right. I think that when, when educators stop having those difficult conversations, that's when things like the achievement gap happens. When educators stop challenging each other, that's when that's when kids are allowed to fail because you're protecting the adult relationship, not the actual learning of the student. And so going back to the biggest challenge for, for a nice person like me, it's hard to sit there and, you know, tell someone that they're not doing their job or that, you know, they may lose their job or, um, or that even though they're trying so hard, it's, it's not good enough. And so doing that and, and managing the relationships is one of the hardest things. But when you do it with, with radical sincerity, it helps, mm-hmm. you know, when you do it with, with no other motive, that's, that's kind of what helps me. And I have to make sure that when I, when I talk to my staff or when I talk to my teachers and my kids, I, I try to, I try to remove ego and I try to remove anything. And I, I do my best to be just a hundred percent radically sincere and, 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 and work from there. Radically sincere. I love that. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Radically sincere. Now you mentioned that you're in a relationship with everybody in the building, basically. So it's 400 and how many children? 90? Four, 470 kids. 470 kids. How many staff? 50 staff. 50 staff. Okay. So you're in, in a relationship with, oh my gosh, over 500 people. Yes. How does, how does April balance having all of those relationships at school and then having your family and your relationship at home? Is there such a thing as work life balance because you have two lovely kids I adore them and your husband how do you balance no, that naughty boys all three of them <laughs> um, uh, something that that, that I, sh- I have struggled with is is being present and I think that for me being at work and being present at work is very important um, being honest um, being succinct when, when possible and I think just just being open, honest, available. And so like I try my hardest to be really present at work, which is which is challenging because when as someone is breaking down or talking to you and, you know, and you're thinking about the list of things that you have to get done. Um, the most important thing in that time actually is the person that, that's talking to you because that moment will probably never happen again in that time when they need you. And so I, I, I often like throw out my list of things to do and I have to start fresh the next day. I've learned to accept that everything is not going to get done. And in fact, most things are not going to get done. And in fact, maybe one thing will get done in a day. And just like going back to it, realizing the work will never, ever, never, ever stop. I'm, I used to be a perfectionist. I no longer am. I, um, you know, I'll, 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 I'll take a mistake. I'll accept a mistake. I will, um, do what I have to do to get through the day and be present. And at the same time, try to reinvent for tomorrow, what I have to get do to get to, to be present for tomorrow as well. But understand that, that some projects may take several days to get done, mm-hmm. um, because they're looping from day to day and just accepting that. And so far as being at home with the kids, I try to be present here as well. Like I often cannot find my phone. My APs are like, <laughs> beasts they're always texting they text non-stop um they're also like in their 30s like these these texters um <laughs> these texters these texters they text they're lovely um they text non-stop but i'm often like not a part of that because i can't i, I can't be present with my kids and and also continue to do work right. um my 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 baby he's two he picked up my phone the other day and he, he turned it on he swiped 
he went to the pictures and started looking at pictures and swiping through pictures. And I felt like, oh, my God, I have failed as a mother. <laughs> but <laughs> my they know intuitively how to do that, though. Operating my iPhone. And, and but, you know, so, so I'm not perfect. And it definitely happens that I that I end up I end up doing work while they're around sometimes. But I, I try my hardest to be present for my for my boys and my and my guy. I love it. Now, what are three tips that you wish someone would have shared with you about opening your own school? Are there three things that you wish you had known or someone has said, so look, this is what you need to know? Great question. I think number one, share your ideas and get feedback right away. Um, share your ideas. Um, know, know what your grounding is. Like, like know the things that you must have, but also be flexible and open to, to, the improvement of your ideas and the betterment of your ideas. So number one, like talk about it, just talk about what you're doing to get feedback. And not all feedback is good feedback. However, you can learn, you can learn from good and bad feedback. So, but I think definitely sharing your ideas is one thing to be able to make the idea better. Um, number two, to, to not be competitive. And this is like doing any project to not be competitive, like see the people in your field as, as team members often. So like I, I have a, a army of principals, a crew of principals that I that I'm so cool with, and they're, they're urban assembly principals for the most part. But when we share our ideas and we're not competitive with one another, like so much can happen between our schools. I think that like not comparing yourself to other people, but and also and also not being competitive, but like th- there is a healthy competition that you can have. But the minute that you are, you know, trying to design either a design or a school, a school that's the absolute best. And then your kids are going to have the best, like ultimately we're serving all kids of New York city. So therefore like any, any sharing of good ideas is good for all kids of New York city. So the competition, if it's making you a closed person, don't do it. If the competition makes you better and makes you, makes you share ideas and absolutely yes. The third thing I would say for someone either opening a school or starting a new project is once you once you commit commit and and do your research and do your homework one thing i am proud of 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 what i did with gateway is that i did a lot of research and homework and in fact that year 2010 to 2011 was probably the the hardest year of my life i i was sleeping maybe 2 or 3 hours a night and i was always exhausted and i was always missing deadlines and and i that for you had to submit um your your proposal um updates and it wasn't because i wasn't working on it i was working on it 24/7 but I absolutely wanted it to be to, to make the right decision for the right reasons. And I read so many books, Elaine. I, I read so many so many theories on everything from homework to whether or not you should kids should sit at round tables versus square tables. Um, everything on parent involvement, academics, PD. I read so many books that that just really for me were, were food for my thoughts but also food for policy and food for how I was going to run my school. If I would have not not done my research and would have just made my school based on my experiences or what I believed, I think that we wouldn't shut down by now. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there, there was research out there. Use the research, um, use the theory. Um, don't be afraid to take risks of course, but like use what is out there and do your homework, like really, really hard to 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 see your organization or see your school um to its fullest potential if there is one book that you remember from that time or maybe there's something um new or more recent that you feel like okay this is the one book not necessarily because you agree with the theory maybe it's something that's a theory that you don't agree with but one book that you could recommend for people who are considering opening a school or being a principal or anything like that what would that book be they're about like four. Okay, that's great. <laughs> okay. I'm going to link to all of them and put them in the show notes so people can find okay. them. Okay, so Focus by Mike Schmoker, which specifically talks about what you do um, to help kids who are struggling with literacy, how you get them on point to literacy and like not waste any time doing some of the, like the, the BS projects that sometimes schools do and teachers give, like how you really help students um, gain authentic literacy. So by the time they do get to your school, by the time they do graduate in, in the 12th grade, they have, they have a greater chance of being college ready. Mm-hmm. Um, the next one would be Multiplication is for White People by Lisa Delpit. And in this book, she talks so much about just the talent that black and brown kids give and how we, we all have in us a a notion that 
it's it's very deep that 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 they sometimes maybe are not good enough and it actually doesn't matter if you're it doesn't matter what you are there is a notion there is a feeling and an understanding of out there I think it's called a racism smog that we all live and breathe in that you see the world through this smog and you you don't know it until you really really start to think about your 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 inherent beliefs so multiplication is for white people is also a really great one um the next the next set of articles so um carol dweck mindset Mm, i've heard of that one insane love that one um she talks a lot about how your mindset means so much. And for me, my whole entire journey has been about developing what that growth mindset, the idea that I can be smarter, the idea that no one was smarter than me. Like Carol Dweck, it, it was really, is very foundational um, in that. And that goes and, beyond education. Absolutely. Absolutely, it does. And the last one would be, would be, um, would be better. Um, so better and good, better and good to great, I think are, are two books that I would absolutely recommend. And they just talk about the structures of organizations and how, you can always be better. And that's one thing as a, as a principle that has been for me, uh, um, something I've strived for is just to be better and to, to know that every single day we could be good, but we can actually be better and to strive for greatness every single day. I love it. That's a fantastic reading list. I'm going to link okay. to all those books so people can find them. Thank you. All right. So now you were featured as a principal of the week in DNA info.com. And you said the quote, this isn't charity work it's justice work. And I think you were talking about this idea of closing the achievement gap, not being charity work. So in mm-hmm. what ways do you feel the work you do is justice work? One of the one of the things that my my students that we do as a school is that we do home visits to every single kid that comes into our school in the ninth grade. And um, there's this idea that your demography determines your destiny. And right now, like, believe it or not, that's that's actually it's actually fact. Demography does determine destiny and it, and it really shouldn't. And when you, I think about all the talent that is out there and, and, and so many of our black and brown kids will be, be because they were born in the zip code they were born in, they don't get the best. And it's not fair. There are, you know, there are kids that, that are that, that and they're wonderful kids, too, that are born like in a in a suburb somewhere. And they go to these beautiful, sprawling campuses with green lawns and like beautiful, huge classrooms. And of, co- of course, that child will, will achieve like the, the world tells them that they're awesome and they're wonderful. Um, and I think that for me, the justice is having black and brown kids who don't come from the from really affluent backgrounds understand and know that their their lives are just as valuable their ideas are just as valuable their thoughts are just as valuable and their future is just as important so to me that's why it's justice work because depending on where you live in depending on what your zip code is everything else says that you're not worth it and everything else says that it's not that it's not um you're not worthy and so the idea of equity in education is 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 just is, is paramount for me what would you say is the greatest lesson having a business or running a school has taught you about yourself as a woman? That it's also okay to to use your emotions at work. Oh. <laughs> it is also okay. If you know me, you know that I'm that I'm crying at work like every 15 minutes or so. <laughs> and I do remember that before, there's something else that before I became a principal, I was nervous about. I was nervous about at, at, at how easily I can cry. I was nervous that, you know, I... I'm, I, I think I'm hyper empathetic sometimes. Like if it doesn't matter who you are, I may I may know you for like three minutes. If you're crying in the corner, I'm crying in the corner too. In about <laughs> in about thirty seconds, if we're holding each other after that. So I think that I was afraid because all the principals, especially the black principals that I knew, those women were like, no joke, feared. Um, you walk down the hall, kids are running, and so I I thought that I had to be that way. And I remember there's a principal who I love and admire so much. She's a superintendent now. Her name is Misha Ross um, Porter. And she, to me, was such an example of someone that uses emotion in her work, that uses, um, like, she's very informal. I'm informal as well. And just seeing that you can actually be yourself and it's okay. You don't have to pretend to be someone else mm. to, to be effective or for people to buy into your ideas. Or So being authentic, being real to myself and not making, when I cry, I may say, sorry, that's about it. But I'm not, I'm okay with it. I'm okay if you see me crying. I'm okay if you see me emotional. I'm okay if I, if I, if my hyper empathy plays a role in the, in the work that I do. And so that's the biggest lesson I've learned as a woman. And so I think that sometimes as women, we feel like we have to check our emotions and be very strong in a, in a professional workplace. But I have found that it is in my tears that I, that I have come to some of the, my, my greatest learnings. 
That's really powerful because you're the second person who has mentioned um, just this idea that it's okay to, quote unquote, cry at work, which is something that I was always raised with, you know, never let them see you cry. You can go in the bathroom and snot and cry, but no one should ever see you cry. And it's sort of this new way of thinking that, no, you can't let them see. And you can tell them why. Oh, I'm so this is making me emotional because of blah, 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 you know, as opposed to I'm just breaking down crying and it makes me a weak person. So it's it's absolutely it's changing my mindset around. I might just start crying in public places. (laughs) So you know what? Wait. And I will cry with you. And you you will cry with me. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So I only have a couple more questions because I know you have to go get the baby. Thank you. Um, What does your support network look like in business and in your personal life? Uh, It looks like uh, my my besties, uh, my my loves from college, um, one I'm speaking with now, um, who are who are my sister friends. And I, I know that if when my back is against the wall, I know that no matter what I can do, I can always go to my to my darlings, to my lovelies, to my honeys. And I, again, I I don't know how I looked out to have just amazing friends. We we met in college uh, the first year, and you're probably since following then, one of us around or something. You know, you like girl, to copy you, people. Girl, you know I was. I probably saw a coat like I like that coat. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> you know I was. Probably followed you somewhere. That's exactly what happened. So my my support network includes my girlfriends from college. Um, who and their sisters, who are who are just amazing to me. Um, my mother, who has been such a uh, such such a help since the birth of my sons. Like I don't know how she has been here when I've not been here for my kids. And those those two boys have brought us so so much closer together. And seeing her as a grandmother, it just it just melts my heart. And by the way, today's her birthday. Happy oh, birthday, mom! Happy <laughs> birthday! I have to call her. Um, it includes my husband, who is the 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 nicest, most supportive human being, not man or person, human being I've ever met in my entire life. There's, he never, he never kicks me when I'm down. He only, he only uplifts me. And he is, he is my best, best, best friend. And I, I am so happy to have him because he's an amazing support to me. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, and my work and my APs and my teachers and my colleagues. Like, I just feel, I feel I feel very supported, but I, I feel supported because I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm afraid to let people know when I'm down either, or I'm afraid to let people know that support is I sexy. need the help, that support is sexy, and, you know, that's taking some time, but I'm not afraid to say, to cry and say help. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, in closing and wrapping up, I have another question for you. If you think over your life and career, and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be, and what would you say? It's a great question, Elaine. Uh, I'm going to thank a group of people. And I think overall, the people I want to thank are teachers. When I think back over my, you know, experience as a young person, I think about Miss Miller, my second, fourth and sixth grade teacher. I think about Miss Warner um, in seventh grade. I think about Mr. Skolnick in high school. And all of these people, you know, when my mom couldn't, um, were there for me, were around and encouraged me. I think about teachers in my school now who do this really difficult work every single day and they do it so well and they do it with love and from a place of just true compassion. And so overall, I want to thank teachers and they also face, teachers today face a uh, a level of accountability that is so high, like the standard for what what it takes to be a great teacher is so high. They're constantly being evaluated. They're constantly being judged. They constantly have to answer to someone around their techniques. And it's not like in dangerous minds where, you know, she stands in front of the class and, you know, she just drops this knowledge and, you know, the kids sit there quietly. Like teaching is not like that. There are 30 different minds and personalities that you have to in some way impact. You have to get to know those minds. You have to respond to those minds. And so teachers, for me, are absolutely, they do the best work in the world. It is the hardest work in the world. But they they come to the table so prepared and accepting and, and responsible for every kid in their class. I really thank them. And I especially thank the teachers that, that, that work with me now. Um, because all of the successes at my school are, is really tied to them and their dedication. So, teachers. But Elaine. What? That's a hard question to answer. I know. I've been told that's an impossible. <laughs> I've been told it's an impossible a- question. Okay, who would you think? <laughs> oh, who would I think? I would think, I think my parents as a unit, though. I know it's not one person. I'm cheating on my own question. But they have just been there for me through everything. You know, from the beginning, obviously, when I was a little girl. And always telling me I could do anything. And up until now, as I'm a 
bigger, but still a little girl, uh, their little girl, and always coming up with crazy ideas for things that I want to do or dreams that I still have. And I've always been like that, always all in my imagination. So I would definitely thank them for just saying, saying or even loving me through when they didn't think I could do it, Mm. saying you can do it. Because sometimes Mm. that's what you just need to know that these people believe in you no matter what, even if they don't know what the hell you're doing. All right. Yay. All right, now. That is beautiful. That is Yay. beautiful. Thank you. No one's ever asked me that. So tell <laughs> us, how can we support you? What can we do? I'm going to put a link to the website for the school, but what other things do you want people to look out for for UA Gateway? Donate to UA Gateway. Absolutely. If you want to if you want to get some students a laptop, pay for an out of city experience um through our gateway. If you would like to help get us new lights on the sixth floor, like whatever it is, um my school is uagateway.org. And um if you want to support to the school, one hundred percent of funds go to um programs for our kids. So absolutely donate to UA Gateway. If you if you're an educator, you want you want to learn more about Gateway or work at Gateway or give us some great ideas, please send them. We are always open to ideas. Um we love to take risks and so we're open to all conversations about it education um to close the achievement gap and do better for our kids i love it and all of that i can link to uagateway.org yes awesome so what's a parting piece of advice you have for us darling before you go pick up my little bundle of joy um parting piece of advice yeah be present live in the moment do you be you um know that no one is smarter than you or more capable They have different smarts. They have different talents. And whatever things you feel like you have to work on, work on them. That's it. I love it. Thank you so much. Oh, one more piece of advice. Yeah. Let kids be kids. Let kids be kids. Let kids be kids. I love that. Hold on one second. All right. Thank you so much for listening to that episode of the Support is Sexy podcast. And I do hope that you got some inspiration from it. And the challenge is for you to do at least one thing. Take one thing from the episode, at least one thing. You can always do more, but at least one thing that will help you move one step closer to your dream. Whether that's launching a business, writing a book, whatever that thing is that you want to do, take something from this episode and move one step closer. And what I'll also ask of you, if you can tell me what you think about the episodes, what we've been doing, what you want to hear what you like, what you experience while you're listening, go over to iTunes, leave us a review and let me know what's going on. What are you thinking? What are you feeling about the show? What else can I do to be of service to you, which is what this is all about, to be of support to you. That's our buzzword, right? You can also go to my website, elainefluker.com slash podcast. So that's E-L-A-Y-N-E. F-L-U-K-E-R dot com slash podcast. Hear more episodes there. Also have a bunch of great videos, tons of information. It's where I'm going to be spending a lot of time and it's where I'd love to connect with you. So again, thank you so much for listening. I truly appreciate you and your support. And the most important thing I want you to remember is having it all does not mean doing it all alone. So now go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.